Hello and welcome to a Legs Matter presentation this morning to you about the power of compression during this our 2021 Legs Matter this week. Um, my name is Gail Curran, I'm a vascular specialist nurse at Northwest Anglia Healthcare Trust um, and I'm also Vice President of the SVN. Joining us today in this session is Sharon Gardner and Claire Stevens, which all, during their presentation also shares a patient story. Um, I'm going to introduce you now to Sharon Gardner, who is a clinical specialist working with H&R Healthcare. Thanks, Gail. So, yeah, I'm Sharon Gardner. I'm a clinical specialist um, and I am a registered general nurse. Uh, I still work in clinical practice and I've got quite a wide background in terms of tissue viability, legal care, district nursing. I'm going to hand you over to Claire now, who can introduce herself. Hello, my name's Claire Stevens and I'm a registered nurse. Um, I've been working in the field of wound healing and leg ulcers for over 25 years. I have a real passion for uh, wounds and compression um, and really making a difference to patients' lives. I'm going to hand you back to Sharon Gardner who will take you through the content for the session. So this afternoon's session, um, like Gail said, we do have a patient's journey who um, our patient will be talking to you about her personal journey and her experiences of leg ulcers and compression. We'll touch on areas that cause problems within your legs and things to look out for in the early stages. We'll talk about different treatments and how they work and how they can be beneficial for you. And we'll also touch on some home care um, and self-care tips and ideas. There obviously will be an opportunity to ask questions. We've got the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen and we have the chat section. And we will try and keep up with the, the comments and the questions as the presentation goes on. Obviously, if we're not able to, we will definitely come to them at the end of the presentation. As I say, we've got patient um, stories within the presentation. So make sure that your sound's on full because she is softly spoken and is um, more quiet than myself and Claire. Um, so make sure that you um, have got headset in or you've got your volume at full volume to be able to hear her. Hi, my name's Anne. I'm 64 years old. I suffer from leg ulcers and lymphedema. I started with the lymphedema probably about 30 years ago, following an accident, a fall that I had, which damaged the lymph nodes. Do you remember how long you've had leg ulcers for? Probably about 20 years. Um, I think the first leg ulcer I got was about 20 years ago. So obviously that was our first introduction to Anne, our patient, and you will hear more from her throughout this afternoon's session. So like I said in the beginning, in terms of what you're going to achieve out of the session, we're going to look at things that would maybe put you at increased risk factor of developing leg ulcers or circulatory problems in your legs. So we've obviously got obesity. So in terms of obesity, you know, there's an increased pressure in the legs and the abdomen. So the increased pressure from the weight causes constrictions on the circulation and, and the ability of the circulation to work in the legs. Obviously, patients who suffer from varicose veins or have had previous DVTs or indeed have a family history of varicose veins where your veins are swollen and enlarged and caused by multifunctioning, by, by malfunctioning valves in the veins. So those valves that normally work effectively within the vein aren't working properly. And you can sometimes perhaps link that in with pregnancy. So, you know, females who have multiple pregnancies, not only due to their hormonal changes to so their progesterone levels affecting the vein wall and the valves, you know, you've got that increased risk of weight um, and obviously that increased risk due to the, the higher blood volume that's circulating. And obviously that blood flow returns restricted because they've got that enlarged uterus from obviously their growing baby. We obviously have highlighted that women are at higher risk, but men still are at risk. You know, there are still risk factors that puts men at risk just as much as women. So obviously there are other factors. You know, I've mentioned previous DVTs, which clots in the veins. There are blood disorders that can affect how the blood clots, how the, you know, the, the blood cells are made up. And obviously we heard Anne in her introduction talk about actually her very early um, leg ulcer problems started after a fall. So, you know, you can have previous injury or trauma or even surgery to the leg, which then can affect the, the circulation and um, the blood flow, how the fluid is managed within the leg just because of some injury. 
There are obviously other risk factors. So, you know, alcohol and substance abuse, sporting injuries, you know, we're thinking about actually we're saying obesity is a risk factor, but then also you've got sporting injuries, military personnel, rugby and football. So there's a whole host of risk factors that could increase your risk of developing circulatory problems. I'm going to hand you back to Claire now. Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, take you through some of the quality of life impacts um, that problems of the lower limb and leg ulcers can have. And the aim of this slide um, is actually to stress the importance of um, early recognition, early intervention, and letting us help you by linking to things like Legs Matter. Um, these uh, are not aimed to scare you at all. Uh, and these come from research of patients like Anne, who have experienced um, leg ulcers. And this is how uh, they voice uh, the impact on their lives. Um, and that's why we are so keen as practitioners uh, to work with you uh, to prevent you from uh, suffering these uh, impacts on your life, but also these quality of life factors help us to further innovate um, treatment options moving forward. And we'll be looking at some of the treatment options that are available as we progress through the presentation. But as you can see on the slide, there's various ways that having problems of your lower leg and in particular, if you develop ulceration, that it can impact on your life. So there's the cost to you yourself as the patient. You heard briefly, uh, and we will be hearing from Anne again after this slide, but it is impossible to put a monetary value on how uh, the cost is to you as a person, your family, um, and your work. Uh, some people, are not able to continue with work when they develop leg problems if they are working, you know, standing on their legs for a long period of time. So it has a huge impact uh, to you and you could actually lose uh, income. Um, so there is a financial cost as well as a, a family and friends cost. There may be things that you have done all of your life, gone dancing, uh, gone out with friends, um, that you find yourself unable to do. Uh, and this can lead to social isolation. Um, and all of these factors uh, tend to link into each other. Uh, for those patients who um, develop the swelling of the limbs and uh, leg ulcers, they can experience pain. And we call, term this chronic pain, pain that, that is there, for long periods of time. Um, and that can have an effect on your um, moods and, and the things that you want to do. Patients who have active wounds often worry about the odor or the smell or leakage. And some, some patients feel that they don't want to go out because they fear that, that something might leak. Uh, or, or someone that they don't know um, might smell an odour from the wound. Uh, and that, again, links in and leads to social isolation. But what I can tell you is that as practitioners, we have lots of things uh, available to us and we manage the odour and we manage the leakage. Um, so, you know, not to be uh, concerned, but talk to us and let us help you uh, overcome these impacts. A lot of patients also talk about uh, how the swelling or the change in the shape of their limb uh, or actually some of the treatments uh, that we use, the bandages uh, often reported as being bulky and they can't wear normal shoes, normal clothing. And some patients complain of sleep deprivation um, and other patients actually will tell you I, I sleep in the chair um, and we don't encourage this we encourage people to go to bed and elevate their legs and then loss of appetite uh, when you've got active wounds it's really important that you have a good healthy balanced diet and all of these factors link in uh, 
uh, to each other. And that's why we are so keen to recognise things early, prevent the wounds uh, from progressing, um, and to ensure that we can help you uh, not have these quality of life impacts, uh, or if you do, then we will minimise these quality of life impacts. I'm going to share with you now another video from Anne, where she will talk about some of the quality of life impacts that she experienced. Can you tell me a bit more about the four layer compression bandages, how, how you felt they were and how they were with you? Um, yeah, they worked. I mean, they were quite painful initially when they first put them on because obviously something that compresses is tight. So especially over like the, the ulcers, um, it was quite painful. They weren't uncomfortable as such, but they were very thick and I was still working at that point and I couldn't get my shoes on. So I had to wear sandals, which laced up winter, summer, whenever, whatever the season or weather. Um, in the summer, they were very, very hot. And of course, as you're walking about, moving, you know, driving, which was uncomfy driving because of the ankle bending a lot. Um, you, I found that they slipped quite a bit. And as they slipped, they would tighten, especially around the ankle, which usually resulted in them having to be cut off quite quickly because then it would start to compromise the circulation. You notice by my toes started to go quite purply when that colour sort of changed and the pain then obviously it would be a very quick cut off of the bandages. That was following the advice of the tissue viability nurse. So Anne has very kindly shared there that, you know, the pain, the wearing of shoes, um, her work situation. Um, and uh, a little later in the presentation, we're going to look at, you know, some of the devices and compression that's available to you, new innovations. And I'm going to hand back to Sharon now, who will take you through the next part of the presentation. Thanks, Claire. So obviously so far, we've talked about the things that you may find put you at risk of leg ulcers. And like Claire said, this isn't to scare you. And I noticed, obviously, Sarah Gardner's put a comment in the chat. It's just to be able to understand that these things are there. And obviously, like Sarah's put, times have changed, you know, things have improved. Uh, you know, as industry partners, we've improved things to try and make life, you know, more comfortable. And, you know, there's a reason why we're touching on these points so far in the presentation. So obviously, the other thing we want to talk about is leg changes. And we talked to Anne about this um, later on, about if she noticed anything different. But sometimes you'll see leg changes. So you'll see things changing in your legs and you might not notice them at first. They might be very insignificant or very minor. But you might start to see changes like swollen legs. And I, for one, know that I have to wear compression stockings if I'm going to fly. You know, I will notice that I get really, really swollen legs if I've been on a plane, not even particularly long haul. You may notice skin changes and wounds are starting to appear. You know, the colour of the skin might look different or little wounds might start appearing on the lower leg. You know, that these can be a sign of the high blood pressure in the deep veins of the leg. You may also start to notice things like loss of hair. Unfortunately, I haven't noticed that yet, but you might start finding loss of hair and actually you might have been a, a regular shaver of your legs or you might start thinking, you know, if you're a man, I've got really hairy legs, but all of a sudden I've got nothing where my sock area might be. You might start noticing that you're getting cramps in your calf muscle or like a heavy, achy feeling in the leg. And you like I say, when we're thinking about skin changes, you might find that your skin's becoming a bit itchy or a little bit dry when actually the rest, rest of your skin's well hydrated. Obviously, I mentioned there about cramps, heavy, achy feeling in your legs. And obviously, these things you may want to discuss with a healthcare professional, because if we're discussing these changes early on, then we may be able to improve the circulation or we may be able to do something that, that improves your leg health. But also thinking about calf pain, you know, if you're noticing that you've got calf pain, 
swelling, heat, maybe redness, um, you know, especially if it's in one leg, you know, we've already talked about briefly about infection, you know, we need to be careful that we're not missing a, a, an infection in the tissue, or, you know, even, you know, more concerning, like I mentioned previously, a DVT. So obviously, if there are any changes that are concerning you, then you definitely need to um, talk to a health pre healthcare professional. So I'm going to hand you back to Claire now. He's going to describe the blood supply in the legs a little bit more in detail. Thank you. So Sharon has mentioned our blood pressure and our blood flow in our legs um, being you know, one of the main things really that, that compression uh, will support. And you can see from the road sign there, um, you know, it, blood needs to flow to the legs, back from the legs, not escape out and create um, swelling. Um, this, we're going to look at our veins and our valves and the calf muscle pump. So those three structures are what keeps our blood flow uh, correct uh, within our legs. So if we start off by looking at our veins, and um, you'll see from uh, the, the uh, graphic image there that we have deep veins, we have superficial veins and connecting veins. And um, I'm aligning that to a motorway uh, situation. So uh, if you can imagine the deep vein, which is that carriageway that has become congested. So then what starts to happen is that pressure builds up on that carriageway, the traffic's not flowing, the blood's not flowing, and you get some uh, traffic that, that squeezes its way off um, the uh, side roads and into the peripheries of the villages, etc. And that, that could be, um, you know, like edema starting by having uh, this uh, filtering off. And what you'll notice with the other carriageway is that there's hardly any traffic there. And that would be the blood that needs to be go back from your leg, back up to the heart. Um, and so essentially, um, you know, I, I shall also be relating this to central heating. So essentially our blood flow within our legs is, is our plumbing. Um, so I, I'm going to try and link things uh, to, to heating and to um, traffic just to make it easier for you to... Uh, understand the blood flow in the leg. So our valves, if you think about central heating um, and we have valves on the central heating and we might have valves on uh, radiators and if they're working correctly, uh, those valves will open and close and they will help uh, the direction of the water flow through that heating system. If they're not working correctly, and uh, even if you turn those valves off, there's still some leakage through, then actually your heating's not going to be working correctly. So you might find that, that the water that's within your radiators is not flowing back through and being heated properly. And this is the same scenario as what's actually happen, happening here um, in, in the veins uh, with the valves. So in the first image there, where you can see it's working correctly, the things that you'll notice are it's, it's a nice, um, not, it's not a bulbous uh, vessel, and you can see the valves opening and closed and the blood flowing as it should through that vein. In the one where it's not working properly, you can actually see that the high pressure has caused uh, like a ballooning of that vessel. And also you've got damage to the cusps on those uh, tiny valves. So what that is actually doing, you haven't got this downward and back flow as you should have, and things are whirling around a little bit. And that's when stuff can actually escape out uh, into the tissues and start causing problems. And we're going to look at how compression supports this later on in the presentation. But something else that's really important uh, as, as part of our lower limb health is our calf muscle pump. And again, uh, if we think about a, 
uh, pumping central heating, it's, it's helping to pump uh, the, the water around your home, uh, through the radiators, and then goes back to the boiler. And so essentially, the calf muscle pump, its role is to help to constrict and squeeze that deep vein and help to push the blood back up towards the heart. Um, and we'll, we'll go through some uh, exercises and uh, other ways that you can help to support uh, the calf muscle. So the combination of the three, our veins, our valves within our veins and our calf muscle pump is, is what we would be looking to support with treatment for, um, with compression. And now I'll hand back over to Sharon. Thanks, Claire. So we've talked quite briefly really about how the blood circulation works, how the veins and the valves when working effectively, you know, help that circulation in the leg. And then obviously the pump, the calf muscle, how really effective it is at pumping that, that blood back up. So we're now going to talk about compression because that's the crux of the session. You know, we wanted to give you the background as to the things you might see, the things that might put you at risk. But then actually the whole crux of the session is about why compression is important. So that's why we've given you that background information. So, you know, if you were um, a person who had early signs of um circulatory problems or you had indeed definitely developed wounds that weren't healing on your lower legs you might be uh, finding that you were in a position to be having some investigations done so you know this is how we find out if you're suitable for compression therapy so that compression that's going to aid that muscle pump that's going to support those valves and veins so just a couple of the examples that we may perform so you may hear it referred to as a doppler or an ABPI or a TBPI, so an ankle brachial pressure index, ABPI, or toe brachial pressure index. It's a calculation of the ratio of blood pressure at the ankle or toe compared with the blood pressure in the arms. So those of you that are listening, um, if you are in compression, you may well have had one of these investigations done at some point, and you may well remember that obviously it's like a blood pressure cuff um, on your arms, and we work out some numbers for there. And then obviously it's a, it's a cuff on the ankle region and we work out some numbers from there listening to your foot pulses near your toe and your ankle. There's obviously um, venous duplex scan, so non-invasive ultrasound of the veins. And that captures two elements of information. So it's used to assess the visual structure um, and assess the blood flow. And it's also useful to assess condition and functioning. So look at what's going on exactly. Look at what's going on on your motorway. See what's going on with that blood flow and make sure it's, it's, it's working effectively and it's not got any incompetences anywhere in the deep or superficial venous system that Claire's just referred to. You know, there's lots of other um, investigations that you may undergo depending on, um, you know, which vascular specialist you're under, but these are the most common ones. And actually, you know, other than some discomfort that you may feel with the cuff on the ankle, if you've got um, broken skin there already, if you've got wounds, you know, they're very simple investigations and generally they don't hurt and they're really important to be able to assess what's going on with your circulation and whether you are suitable for compression. So in terms of the readings, what do the readings actually mean? So this is just very basic terms related to ABPI, so related to the ankle brachial pressure index. So if you had a reading between 0.8 and 1.3, then you would be suitable to go in what's called standard compression. You may hear people refer to it as full compression. So that is the, the, the strongest compression to be able to put on that compression and aid that muscle um, pump, aid that circulation. You may hear readings referred to as between 0.5 and 0.8 ABPI. And that's when there's some moderate um, peripheral arterial disease. So there's some disease in the arteries as well. Um, and that's when you would probably hear um, professionals referring to light compression or reduced compression. You know, the two terms are used interchangeably but mean the same thing. And basically that's still putting some compression on your leg but it's a, a reduced pressure. So it wouldn't feel as tight maybe um, in comparison to, to full or standard compression. 
So how does compression work? So basically that, that lovely animation that Claire showed you, you know, where you, you've got a bit of chaos going on in your motorway, your slip road's blocked, you've got people trying to turn back because they're, you know, there's no one else there. So they're trying to turn back on the slip road and come back the wrong way. You know, without that compression, you've got those, those veins and those valves that aren't functioning. They're a little bit floppy. They're letting things back the wrong way on the slip road. So they're not functioning effectively. But actually applying compression therapy, it uses that controlled pressure. So all the way up from kind of the ankle up the calf way to increase the blood flow in your legs and improve that blood flow back to the heart. So it does that by supporting the structures that we've already mentioned. And it's kind of like um, a supportive sleeve around the outside of the limb. It supports the calf muscle. So it encourages it with the exercises that we've mentioned and we'll come back to to pump and squeeze and empty the veins and prevent that back flow back down through. It reduces blood pressure and excessive flow in the legs and supports the valves, supports leakage, reduces that swelling. Thinking back to what I said about having to wear flight socks now when I go on a plane. So I'm gonna bring you back to Anne now, um, just so she can talk to us a little bit more about her experience with compression. So did you stay in those compression bandages until you also healed? I what did. happened after that? Yes, I did. I, I stayed in the compression bandages. It took quite a long time. Um, but once it healed, I was measured up for the totally um, precious so uh, stockings, which I then continued to wear all the time. I actually went for the open toe ones. I found them more comfortable. They didn't sort of squeeze your toes or push your toes too much. Um, and they sort of accommodated for swelling as well. And I wore those constantly. So what happened after that? Due to my health, and I, I did have asthma, which started to become quite pronounced. I decided to go up smoking, which I did. Very proud of myself. But unfortunately, I had quite a rapid weight gain. This had quite a negative effect on the lymphedema. Lymphedema did worse as the years went on, but I think that the, the sort of the weight gain put an awful lot of pressure on my legs, caused the lymphedema to get worse. Obviously, I then swelled worse. The circulation in my legs wasn't as good. Um, you know, you get pressure from your tummy when you're sitting down, when you've got a lot of weight on you, which can press on the legs. Um, and then I had quite a nasty leg also then, um, which deteriorated very, very quickly and went quite deep. I'll go through the uh, different types of compression that, that are available to you. Um, so there are various different types of compression available. And I mentioned early when we were looking at uh, quality of life impacts and uh, it's those impacts that have stimulated us to look at, um, you know, different types of compression. How can we make it uh, more friendly for, for the patient. You heard Anne talk in her uh, a clip about the bandages being quite bulky and not being able to get shoes on and talking about people of working age uh, who require compression. So I'm just going to go through um, some of the various types. Um, if you are uh, actually prescribed compression, you may have one or, or many of of these types of compression throughout the uh, lifetime of, of your treatment regime. Um, so we'll start off by looking at compression stockings. So compression stockings uh, can be used when you, um, uh, as Sharon said, uh, get the first signs of uh, swelling within your legs. Um, and so for instance, using them on, on flights, um, but if you are treated for a, a leg ulcer in, let's say, compression bandaging, once you are healed, uh, then we would put you into compression stockings. And compression stockings uh, is a life uh, long commitment. Uh, and I, I wear compression stockings every day of, of, of my life. 
um, and you do get used to uh, wearing them. So compression stockings can be knee length, they can be thigh length, we, they, they can be for upper limb, open toe, closed toe, various colours. Um, so, you know, what industry have tried to do to do is bring forward products um, that that we can wear every day of our life that that people unless you tell them don't know is actually compression and then compression devices so um, to allow patients to have uh, more control uh, themselves uh, these are uh, what we call velcro wraps um, and, and that helps you to be involved with uh, the putting on and taking off um, of your compression. Um, and then there are devices that are available. There are devices that work with like a pump air action. So you can have a device that just goes onto the thigh um, uh, or devices where you can put your limbs in and it will pump up air and release and that will be squeezing and release and squeeze and release um, and often you find that patients who maybe uh, are working uh, will have a, a device that they use intermittently um, uh, for their treatment and then when you talk about um, compression bandages there are various types so Sharon has talked about light compression and standard compression um, so the bandages that are available you could be offered a two layer a three layer a four layer um, some of the new uh, bandage systems we have worked on reducing uh, the numbers of layers so that on uh, you can get your shoes on uh, you can get trousers on um, so there are various types of, of compression uh, available to you what I would urge you to do is you know it, talk with your practitioner um, if if something is you know not you, you're not able to get your shoes on like and wasn't or or and also talked about bandages slipping down talk to us let us know and we can look at other options for you and Sharon also mentioned the skin conditions. So we also use uh, medicated uh, bandage layers um, that are able to treat the skin condition beneath uh, the, the layer that gives the squeeze. Um, so all of, of these compression uh, uh, images here are there to, to support the calf muscle pump, squeeze the deep veins, get the swelling and, and, and the blood flow back up to the heart with options of treating skin conditions, intermittent, and then you compression stockings, which uh, must be worn really uh, for life. The compression that you're given will be based upon your clinical need, um, whether you require light compression or, or uh, full compression and also on you know considerations for your uh, your lifestyle um, so if you have friends and family who have leg ulcers and, and conditions of the lower limb you may not be offered uh, the same uh, type of treatment and that will be for a clinical reason or for a reason that better suits your quality of life so if you are um, put into compression bandages, um, the frequency of the bandage change will be determined by your practitioner. Um, so very often, if uh, you have relatively swollen legs, um, the, the bandage frequency of change might be a bit more frequent in the first couple of weeks. And then as the limb swelling starts to go down, what we're able to do is extend uh, the life of that frequency of change um, up to a maximum uh, of a week. Uh, when you have compression applied, uh, you will be given patient information leaflets and advice leaflets that, that will uh, essentially tell you, um, you know, about doing some exercises, about elevating the limb, about not removing uh, your bandage system and then unless. So it will also 
uh, let you know signs to look out for. So you also heard Anne mentioning in her video that her toes uh, had, had gone a little bit uh, blue-purple, so immediately it was cut off. So that would be one of the times in your information leaflet that we would tell you to, to remove the bandage system. And it gives you information on, you know, when uh, to seek advice and uh, a contact number uh, or where to go to access uh, support. Um, and also, if you're wearing the bandages then for seven days, uh, it will also give you tips about how to keep the bandages dry um, and, um, you know, to allow you to uh, bathe and shower um, and um, elevating your limb and doing uh, your foot exercises. So the best thing really is to talk to us. And so if you do experience things like slippage or you, you, you can't get footwear on, talk to your practitioner and see if there are any other um, uh, options available to you uh, to help improve uh, your experience of uh, compression. And then um, our compression stockings. Uh, I think the key thing here is wear for life. And um, I think if we look at the, the road uh, scenario so if that was uh, a, an accident that was blocking that carriageway and we go in with our uh, uh, recovery and we we open that road up and everything's flowing again so that's us coming in with the compression therapy getting rid of that accident uh, however if all the roads are running fine uh, but another accident uh, could happen so this is why we say wear the stockings for life keep supporting that calf muscle keep supporting uh, the veins and the valves and keep uh, you know your limbs from from getting swollen uh, and rather than go down the route of, of running into uh, problems again um, <clears throat> the applicator so the stockings are available in different classes so that means uh, that they you can have a class one, two, three, and they, they get stronger. So your practitioner will advise you what class of stocking you need. And we'll also um, show you application and removal. And there are devices available as well that can help you to assist, particularly, you know, if you haven't got the hand dexterity or you're unable uh, to reach down, there are things uh, that, that we can help um, direct you towards. Also really important uh, uh, to make sure that the, the washing instructions are, are followed, um, that, that it's gentle hand wash and we don't use fabric conditioners and we don't dry on radiators. So the compression stock and stockings, it's the elasticity within those that is giving the squeeze on, on the leg and that's why it's important um, that, that we follow those instructions and your stockings will be replaced uh, after six months and you normally get one to wash and one to wear so that you can wear them all of the time and as I mentioned before they do come in different colours so that gentlemen can uh, very often want to, a darker stocking uh, to wear beneath the trousers um, as do I, um, and I wear mine, uh, as I've said, every day. So in the summer, you might opt for, for a lighter colour uh, to wear with certain clothing, and then in winter, a, a darker colour. But I do have to say that a lot of the companies have bought some uh, really uh, uh, wonderful colours uh, to the market to make compression stockings a bit more fun. So uh, there's lots of things out there. And now I'll hand you back to Sharon. Thank you. So obviously just following on from the self-care element, what you can do at home. So obviously, you know, our skin, I always like to say our skin's our bubble wrap. So our skin's our protective barrier, isn't it, from outside world, outside debris and bugs and stuff. And we know that the skin on the leg is very fragile. We know that obviously with advancing changes to the circulation to the leg, the skin does become very precious and very delicate. 
So, you know, we may already apply cream to our face every day. You know, we may already use body lotions. So actually we need to look after the skin on our legs just as carefully. You know, it's, it's just as fragile, in fact, more fragile, and we need to maintain its integrity. So obviously if you are wearing bandages, the nurse who is applying the bandages may give you advice on skincare. You know, if you're wearing your own stockings and like Claire said, you've got that dexterity to be able to remove them or you've got aids that can help you change them yourself. And obviously you need to be maintaining the hydration um, of the skin underneath your compression. You'd need to be using very gentle products on your skin, which don't contain any additives or anything that you may be allergic to. So something that you know suits your skin just to keep that, that moisturization in there. Obviously we talk about staying active and obviously those, those foot exercises. And while I've been sat here at my desk, which I regularly do, is I do my, my, my calf exercises. So if you put your hand on the back of your calf and then sort of flexed your foot up and down as if this was your foot, you can feel, you'll be able to feel your calf muscle move. And it's that movement that helps keep the blood flowing in your legs. Obviously when we're walking around, it's that movement that happens naturally. But, you know, if your mobility isn't as good as it used to be, or maybe you're struggling to walk with, for whatever reason, you know, arthritis or, or even, you know, bulky bandages, you know, you may need to do these exercises while you sat, while you sat down. And it's just about flexing, flexing your feet, rotating at your ankle and just doing it quite a few times during the day just to keep that calf muscle moving as much as possible. Obviously, we mentioned that maybe, um, you know, diet appetite may reduce for a multitude of reasons. But I know Claire touched on the fact that actually we need to maintain healthy diet and plenty of fluids again to stay hydrated. You know, as your wounds heal, if you've got open ulcers on your legs, they're going to use a lot of goodness from the food that you eat. And it's really important that your diet is rich in protein, vitamins and minerals. And obviously it's found in a variety of food, you know, meat, fish, eggs, cheese, as well as all your staple fruit and vegetables. And obviously if you were struggling in terms of your diet, if you didn't feel you were getting all the nutrients you needed, speak to one of us, you know, speak to a, your nurse or a health professional or, or your, your GP about, you know, support in terms of healthy eating. We obviously talk about elevation, so foot elevation and thinking back to my puffy ankles when I've been on a plane, you know, your ankles swell because the, the, the blood flow slows down. And you might find that your ankles are less swollen when you've been in bed. So when you've gone to bed at night, you've slept in a bed, you, your feet are more elevated, then you might find that in the morning they're not as bad and they get worse as the day because of gravity. When you're sitting or standing, um, you might find that that swelling does increase in your legs. And obviously, alongside wearing your compression, you know, limb elevation, foot elevation is the really, really key thing to help reduce that swelling and actually make that, that compression comfortable. So getting your, your, your feet as high as you can, higher than hip height if possible, um, just to help the gravity drain that fluid away. Obviously, it's really important that you keep in touch. You know, if you're worried about anything with your legs, it's important to tell um, your healthcare professional as soon as possible if anything's changing or if anything's worrying or like we've said already, you know, there's anything unusual with your compression, the colour of your skin, your toes, that kind of thing, then keep in touch. And actually the whole point of this session is to explain why lifelong compression treatment is important and, and how powerful compression is at really improving that circulation in your legs. So we're going to show you another clip from Anne. Um, who talks about her experiences with other compression methods that, that Claire's already touched on. And how was that leg ulcer treated? They started off with the four layer again, but then decided on an, um, a fairly new treatment that they were, they were starting, which was zinc um, bandages. I think there were only two layer. And the first layer that went next to the skin was... Um, a bandage that was impregnated with zinc and they were really nice they were very pleasant they were comfortable they were cool when they were first put on they obviously weren't as bulky um and they, they did seem to heal it quickly or should i say a lot quicker than the, the the normal four layers and where are you at now in terms of what treatment you have in um unfortunately following um my husband's passing away quite suddenly a few years ago. The weight has increased even more. 
I spent quite some months after Dave died lay on the city um, with the dog. Not recommended really when you've uh, got leg ulcers, open sores on your legs. Um, it, it has got a lot worse. My circulation isn't as good as it was, mainly due to the the the, the weight gain really and the the cellular. I, I kept getting cellulitis, um, and now I wear um, the compression wraps because that's something I can actually put on myself um, if I'm not seeing the nurse one week. I still see the nurse every week to come out because. I've just actually come out of hospital following my sixth episode of sepsis, which occurs. It starts with cellulitis in the leg, the bacteria, the germs, whatever it is, immediately goes into my blood and causes sepsis. And within a couple of hours, I'm sort of down and in hospital. <clears throat> so in summary, you know, development of leg ulcers can be caused by a variety of risk factors. You know, we've talked about all the different risk factors and, you know, that's probably not a completely exhaustive list. We know that there are a number of different compression therapies available to suit individual needs. You know, Claire's talked about all the different types that are on the market. And, you know, we know compression is a lifelong commitment. We know that compression, you know, isn't just something that, you may wear while your wound heals. We know that actually, if you've got a vascular compromise, if you've got a problem with your venous system in your legs, that compression is going to be something you're going to need to wear forever. And obviously listening to Anne um, talking about her um, story over the years, you know, we know that Anne's still in compression. And actually that that is the key to this. Early assessment and management can really improve quality of life. And, you know, we wanted to be able to highlight any symptoms that you may be noticing that you may not have thought of before this. So we've just got one final clip um, from Anne about her uh, journey and her story. This is probably the million dollar question, really. But <laughs> if you've obviously got an extensive history in terms of leg ulcers, lymphedema, circulatory problems, if you could have changed anything, again, million dollar question, what would you have changed? Oh, wait. Yeah. Um, I've always had a problem with weight from being a child, but I think that the crux of most of my problems has been my weight. And if I had my time over again, I'd do everything the same, marrying young, having children young, but I would address my weight, not only by food management but by what's going on inside your head because sometimes weight gain isn't about eating too much it's about what's going on inside your head and had I taken the steps to address it then I don't think I'd be in the state that I'm in now So thank you everybody that has stayed with our session. Um, thank you very much to Claire um, from Milliken, personally for me and personally thank you to our patient Anne who is watching. Um, it, it was a very difficult story for Anne to tell, uh, very emotive, very challenging. Um, so yeah, a, a massive thank you to her. So obviously I know the, the chat and the question sections kind of been pinging up while we've been doing our session. Um, so yeah, we, we're all here now to have a look at these questions. Um, Gail, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks ever so much ladies for a brilliant presentation. And also thank you, Anne, if you are listening, it's so lovely to hear from patients and their experience. I think it's really important. It makes it more of a human story and people can relate to that. Um, I think one of the questions in the chat, if we do that one first, there was a question about why do people have a loss of appetite um, with pain? Um, I think you did reply as well, Sharon, during that about, you know, pain can cause a loss of appetite. Um, but it's also multifactorial, isn't it, really, in terms of what the patients are going through? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I was trying to, um, it was Leslie, wasn't it? I was trying to reply, yeah. Leslie, but just in case Claire started just kind of going, Sharon, back to you again. <laughs> I do apologise for the short reply. 
Uh, was there any other questions? Yeah, so <laughs> there, there's quite a few in the questions section. Okay. Um, so there's one, I'm new to wearing compression stockings. This comes from an anonymous um, person. Um, I have secondary lymphedema and chronic venous insufficiency. And unfortunately, wearing uh, the stockings uh, triggers eczema, itchy sore blisters on my feet. But if I don't wear them, my legs get very swollen, sore, and my patches of venous eczema becomes inflamed. So it's that vicious circle. But what can I do to balance my needs? Yeah, and I don't know if Claire's got any kind of input really on that one, but it is, you're absolutely right. It is a vicious circle. You know, it's managing those symptoms from the eczema. Um, I don't know whether there's any kind of relation to any additives within the stockings, whether there's any allergy related thing or not. I don't know whether, Claire, you've got anything you want to add. Um, <clears throat> well, first, firstly, I, I'm sorry to, to hear that you're experiencing um, problems. I think the things that, that um, spring to mind for me are firstly, um, you know, is there some uh, dermatology uh, involvement for, for management of the eczema? And secondly, actually, are we able to look um, if it's something related to the stocking to maybe a cotton mm. stocking that isn't going to uh, give you the um, dermatology eczema problems that, that you're experiencing now. You certainly speak to your practitioner. Um, if, you, if your compression stockings are um, you know, not cotton-based, we need to look to see if, if there's something else that, that we can offer, offer to you um to enable you to receive your, your compression uh, the, you know there will be options out there speak to your practitioner is what i, I would say definitely mm. i think that dermatology referral can be quite important in those situations yes. can't it yes um, absolutely. definitely um another question was people do report that compression can be painful what advice can you give to deal with this um, yeah and i think sorry claire were you going to speak on no, uh, I, I was going to, um, I, I actually forgot to mention that whilst I was talking, so I, I, I want to apologise. Um, and, you know, the pain uh, relating to compression is, is um, it can be the fact that the swelling um, or something that's going on with the wound can, can actually be uh, creating the pain. And, um, you know, we can... Uh, have patients who are in light compression that's only giving half of the squeeze. And whilst you've got all of that fluid within your limb, that is going to give you uh, painful legs that, you know, the sooner we can get that, that fluid out of the limb. But also if you've got open wounds, sometimes the pain can be uh, related to uh, infection uh, to, to do with the wound. So again, it's a case of, um, you know, let's work together on um, getting that excess fluid out of your limbs and, and let's make sure that, that we're, you know, keeping an eye on your wound and, and dealing uh, with pain related to that. And again, it's, it's a multifactorial um, thing, pain and, and leg ulcer management and then receiving uh, the treatment. And, and yeah, it can be very challenging from a clinical and patient perspective um, uh, to, to get on top of the pain. But also, um, uh, you know, there are pain specialists as well. Um, and a lot of the clinical areas will now have multidisciplinary, so you might go to a clinic where they've got a nutritionalist, they've got a pain specialist, they've got a vascular specialist. Um, and, you know, it, it could be that you could have um, some pain relief um, that will help you through those stages of, of getting to where you need to get uh, and break that vicious circle really is, is, you know, I don't know whether anyone has anything to add there. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And all I was going to say, Claire, was obviously um, coming back to the ankle brachial pressure index, so coming back to the Doppler. I know um, Christy did comment in the uh, the live chat that actually some patients do find them really painful depending mm -hmm. on the location of, you know, their, their broken skin, their ulcer. Um, 
and it, it can it can, you know they it can be too painful for that you know the the pump to be taken up to a high enough level for the nurse to get a reading mm-hmm. and it kind of links into what you've already said claire it's multifactorial it's making sure we're trying to eliminate um the causes of the pain and making sure that you know there is enough sort of pain management to suit the needs mm. and on that note in terms of the abpi then yes if, if you can't get an abpi because of pain and discomfort then absolutely a toe pressure is the way to go um, yeah. but do be aware you may need to be referred to an alternative healthcare practitioner to have a toe pressure done because not everybody is is able to do that in practice so um, but it is available for patients if they're unable to tolerate that abpi um, so a quick question, uh, do nurses, nurses need to be trained in leg ulcer care and bandaging? Yes. I think, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We'd all agree. Absolutely. Think, yeah, even the basics of bandaging, I think we don't yeah. always get right in practice. Sort of, I work in a hospital setting and you go around the wards and absolutely it, it's not always right. And it can cause massive issues in terms yeah. of um, pressure ulcers, further breakdown mm. of ulceration and that tourniquet effect of the swelling below the bandage and above the bandage so yeah absolutely. Like, you do still see that absolutely I mean yeah. I like I still work in clinical practice and you know I don't know whether they just don't teach it in nurse training anymore but even that knee bandaging you, you still see that mm-hmm. so yeah absolutely yeah. yeah um how soon can an individual with leg and skin changes and normal abpi be started on compression therapy when they have been recently diagnosed with a dvt and started on a pixaban just read that question again gail sorry so it was from eleanor uh, how soon can individuals with leg and skin changes a normal abpi be started on compression therapy when they have recently been diagnosed with a dvt and started on a pixaban Mm. Mm. I think is that one for you, Gail? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's it our is, expert. <laughs> I think it is always a question, isn't it? Is should patients be put into compression mm. if they've got a diagnosed DVT? I think if it's diagnosed and patients are on treatment, treatment and it's yeah. been commenced, then there's no reason why patients should not be in compression and appropriate yeah. compression. Um, and again, it's important to make sure that they are accessing the correct healthcare professionals to receive that treatment. Yeah. Um, the, so just lastly, I think we've got a couple more minutes. Um, somebody said, I haven't been able to find any since COVID, but I'm not sure what that's related to. Um, and I think some the lady or gentleman has replied back about the cotton stockings and said that they were told they couldn't get them on prescription and needed to source them privately. Uh, so just got a referral to dermatologists so waiting for an appointment I don't know if that is the case from a point of view of a primary care I'm in the hospital setting so I don't know if that is accurate or not um, as far as I'm aware cotton stockings are still available on prescription now yeah. whether it comes down to CCG um mm. prescribing Gail because obviously every area is different um but as far as I am aware, you know, they are still absolutely available on prescription. But um, luckily, obviously, that they've said they've now got that referral to a dermatologist. So that would, you know, that would improve um, absolutely. Their, 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 their access to other items. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that one about not being able to find anything since, since COVID, that was a question that was asked about training for leg ulceration. Uh-huh. Sorry, I did answer that. Okay. Um, and said that there's leg ulcer courses and obviously industry do offer training yeah. days. Um, I think it has been very difficult since COVID in terms of accessing any sorts of courses, but these are starting to become more available now, I think, aren't they? Sort of yeah. from your industry partners and your experience, are you setting things up again? Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're I mean, poor Claire, she was probably just going to reply about her jet setting around the world. <laughs> definitely, I don't get to jet set yet. <laughs> we're both in, definitely um Claire obviously more than me at the minute we are seeing uh nurses practitioners face to face and we are supporting hands-on um you know training for leg ulceration and compression yeah brilliant um 
just conscious of the time because we're coming up to yeah. the end but I think yeah. everybody seems to all the feedback's been absolutely brilliant and actually I've had a, a message from a friend during this about her mum and her swollen mm-hmm. legs and she's been to her GP before and has struggled and she said what can I do she, my mum's now been on hold for 25 minutes on her GP practice so you can't get um, a GP appointment so um, I've also suggested you make an appointment to see the nurses you don't yeah. have to see the GP a healthcare professional in terms of practice nurse should be able to assess your legs as well yeah. um, and be able to refer back to the GP if you need GP advice and support. Definitely. So, yeah, no, that's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, ladies, and thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.